This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Today, it's my pleasure and honor to welcome one of our dear friend and long-term friend at the ANS, uh, Dr. Roger Bland, who joined the ANS in 1991, is currently the president of the Royal Numismatic Society. Um, Roger retired from the British Museum in 2015, where he was the keeper of the Department of Britain, Europe and Prehistory. At the British Museum, he served as keeper of the Department of Portable Antiquities and Treasure from 2005 until 2013, then keeper of the Department of Prehistory and Europe from 2000, sorry, 2012 to 2013, and keeper of the Department of Britain, Europe and Prehistory from 13 to 15. Since 2015, Roger has been a visiting professor at the University of Leicester and a senior fellow at the Macdonald Institute for Archaeological Research, University of Cambridge. So without further ado, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for that, Gilles. Um, yes, that was my British Museum career. Um, uh, I've been happily retired, what, for, um, it'll be eight years quite soon, and um, which has given me a bit more time for numismatics, which is great. And um, it's a um, great honor to come and talk to you as well. Um, I've got many very happy memories of visiting the ANS. My, my first visit, I think it was um, back in 1987. Um, I, uh, ten I was at the summer school in 1991 as visiting le um, lecturer, which was um, a great experience. And um, I visited more recently to receive the Archer Huntington Medal in 2018. So I've got very many happy memories um, of the ANS um, in, in its various um, locations. It's a great research institution, and um, I've made many really great friendships um, there as well. So uh, the talk I'm, um, subject I'm going to talk about today is, is um, about a project that I've been working on um, for a, a very rather long time. Um, probably the origin probably goes back to the 1980s, actually. Um, it became a PhD thesis in 1991, um, uh, and that was the uh, corpus of the coinage of Gordian III from the mints of Antioch in, in Syria and Caesarea in Cappadocia. And that book is now in proof. Um, I would have saved myself an awful lot of work if I'd published it back in 1991, but I, I didn't. Um, it's now grown threefold as a result of that um, delay, but it is now in proof and it will be published um, by the Royal Numismatic Society in the summer. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, about the project and I'll describe how things have changed um, since that earlier um, piece of work, which became a PhD 30 years ago. Um, and I'll talk about the methods I used for updating the dye study that I did back then. Um, and I may go into some of the finer points of such a project. I know it's a fault of we numismatists that we can get so bound up in the technicalities of our research that it can sometimes happen that we lose sight of the bigger picture. And the risk of that is that, of course, that we end up talking just to ourselves and scholars in other disciplines shrug their sh shoulders and ignore the fruits of our hard-won labors. So, um, but before I launch into the minutiae of this type of research, I'll start by sketching the bigger picture and explaining what light such a study can shed on the history of the period. So, um, just to um, uh, fix where we're talking about geographically, um, I'm talking about the coinages of two different cities, um, Antioch, Antiochia, which is um, the lower arrow there on the um, Antioch in Syria, capital of Coeli, Syria, northern Syria. Um, and um, the arrow above it um, is Caesarea in Cappadocia, capital of the province of Cappadocia. 
Antioch's believed to have been the third city in the Roman Empire after Rome and Alexandria. And as I expect you'll know, it was an important early center of Christianity, but it was also an important mint. It struck local bronze civic issues, silver tetradrams, and from time to time, Roman silver denarii and Antoniniani, which I'm going to call radiates in this talk. Um, the radiate coins, um, Antoniniani, which were minted at Antioch in the third century AD, were not well understood. And in many cases, they were confused with coins of Rome as they often copied the types used at Rome. And we'll see that in a, in a few minutes. On other occasions, they produced designs of their own, often getting the Latin legends wrong, betraying the fact that the engravers who produced the dyes were Greek rather than Latin speakers. And down to 253 AD, Antioch also struck a completely different denomination, a larger silver denomination, the Tetradram, with legends in Greek, as well as occasional bronze civic issues as well which also have Greek legends. And these tetradrams and civic issues were traditionally not catalogued along with the denarii and the radiates. So they're not to be found in the volumes of Roman imperial coinage. And they are now in the uh, new Roman provincial coinage um, volumes. Well, the coinage of Antioch seemed to me to be a fertile subject for a detailed study. And I originally focused on the reigns of Valerian and Gallienus, a little bit later, um, from 253 to 268. I thought I would extend the study forward to the reign of Aurelian, um, up to 275, and then back to, in, in time, to um, the reign of um, Gordian III. And it's about him I'm going to talk about today. His dates are 238 to 244 AD. And I visited museum collections, collecting details and taking photographs of coins of Antioch over quite a long period of time. And the product of this work was a photo file that fills a dozen drawers. However, it gradually became clear there's far too much material for a detailed doctoral study. And then I eventually focused on the first part of the period, the reign of Gordian III, which covers six years from 238 to 244. So um, this is the part of the world we're looking at. The Roman frontier, the Limes, runs is this red line along um, on the right-hand side um, of, of the map. Um, and, uh, it's, and then another important site um, which I'll, I think I will be mentioning is Dura Europos, which is, I hope you can see my cursor. It's, it's down at the bottom right hand side of the map. It's not actually marked on this map because it was beyond the frontier as it was drawn at this time. It became within the Roman Empire in the reign of, um, of Lucius Verus. So, um, so here are some of the coins. And um, there are two series um, of radiate coins made by Gordian at Antioch. Um, these are the um, uh, uh, coins that are often known as Antoniniani. Um, we think they were traditionally, they're thought to be double denarii. I think they were probably tariffed at one and a half denarii at this period. That's another matter. The first series, Coin of the first series is at the top here, top left. Coin of the second series is below it. And then over on the right hand side of the screen, we've got two examples of the tetradrams, which were being made at the same mint and at the same time, um, but with legends in Greek, as I mentioned earlier. And there are four series of those. Um, the first and the third of the major series the top right coin is first from the first series, the bottom right from the third series. Yeah, and there's a mistake with that caption. And Antioch, what of Antioch? Well, um, you will no doubt have heard about the tragedy that struck the city 
in at the beginning of February, the earthquake, the terrible earthquake, which seems to wreak awful damage um, on the, the modern city of Antioch. And there's a, a the, 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 the view at the top right of the, the slide is a view taken of looking down Main Street of Antioch, um, showing the terrible damage wrought by the earthquake. I believe that the center of the city, nearly all the houses are um, effectively have been destroyed. Below that is a picture of Antioch in happier times before the earthquake. Um, with those mountains behind it, um, which you can um, see. Um, and then a view of Antioch from um, the 19th century, from 1841, from a, a French engraving, and when it was really quite a small place, um, uh, and a backwater of the Ottoman Empire. Through a sort of quirk of geography, Antioch, although it was in ancient Syria. It's now in the um, present day country of Turkey in a province that um, uh, extends down um, south from to in the southern um, fringe of Turkey called Hatay province. Right, and then the other city I'm talking about, Caesarea, capital of Cappadocia, about 250 miles north of Antioch. Um, it's the current day um, city is known as Kayseri, and it's mainly famous for being in the center of area where there are many rock tombs. This is a view of um, the castle that was built um, in the 13th century, and um, I don't think there are very many remains of the Roman period surviving. Both Antac and Antioch, Antakya, and Caesarea Caesari have uh, been more or less continuously inhabited since ancient times. So the remains of the ancient period in both cities is um, limited and largely um, underground. Uh, so, um, uh, and here are some of the, the coins of Gordian um, from Caesarea, silver coins on the left, and, and Caesarea also struck in bronze, unlike Antioch, uh, which didn't strike in bronze in Gordian's reign. So in silver, we have three denominations in size, the largest a tridram, the three drachma coin. Remember the big um, silver coins from um, Antioch are tetradrams, four drachma coins. Then we've got a two drachma piece in the middle, a diadram and a drachma at the bottom left. And then we have bronze coins on the right. Um, and um, the Caesarean coins are all dated by regnal year. Um, they were struck between years three and seven of Gordian's reign. And um, we also have coins of Gordian's wife, Tranquilina, uh, from Caesarea, which we don't have from Antioch. Gordian married Tranquilina in 241 AD, and, uh, but um, Antioch never struck any coins in her name, but Caesarea did. And um, just draw your attention to the design on the reverses of the two silver coins at the bottom left, and this the bronze coin sent in at the bottom middle. It's a mountain that we are looking at there. And the mountain is called Mount Argeus. That's the Latinized version. It's still there, of course, not surprisingly. Here it is. It's um, today it's known as a CS dog. Um, it, pardon my pronunciation of modern Turkish. Uh, um, <clears throat> and it lies 15 miles south of the city, but it is the highest mountain in that part of Turkey, 12,800 feet high. And it does, um, you can see why it dominates the reverse designs of the coins of Caesarea, because you can see it's still a dominating feature on the skyline of um, Kays the current town of Kayseri today. Okay, so um, uh, these were the coins I studied in my PhD thesis, which was completed in 1991, but um, as I said, never published. 
Um, and um, <clears throat> one of the um, observations that I, that I was able to make was the very the close similarity, stylistic similarity between the coins from Caesarea and Antioch. Here's a, a, a couple of examples. Um, on the left, we've got coins of Caesarea, um, and on the right, we've got coins of Antioch. And I think you can see that um, they are really rather rather similar. And I think that they were um, made by the same engravers. Um, and I believe that the um, production um, switched between Antioch uh, moving to Caesarea in 241, staying there for um, just under two years and then switching back to Antioch in 243. So what's the purpose? What was the purpose of the study that I did? Well, I was wanting to elucidate four main problems. First was the relationship between the Latin legend radiate coins or Antoniani and the Greek legend tetradrams from Antioch, as I explained. Historically, they've always been catalogued separately in separate um, works of reference and not studied together. So it was a fairly sort of safe, safe bet that studying the two coinages together would produce new insights. Then secondly, the Roman coinage produced in the East is something I've also already mentioned during the third century is not well understood. And um, the coins, particularly the first series of um, radiates from Antioch are uh, very frequently confused with those of Rome. Um, then I also wanted to clarify the attribution of some of the issues of Gordian. Um, that were normally assigned to Antioch. Um, previous people to study these coinages have attributed them to other mints, um, uh, Viminacium in the Balkans and um, other, other mints in Mesopotamia um, have also been suggested. Um, I'm fairly certain that they are all from um, Antioch, which was such an important city throughout this period. And then also, um, to look at the relationship of the coinage of Caesarea to that of Antioch. Um, and I showed the, the similarities um, just the um, last slide, but one between those coins. Well, um, in the 1980s, one worked in a very different way from the way it worked today. Um, I worked through taking um, photographs as one did in life size. Um, uh, I hadn't really sort of appreciated just what you could have, how much easier I could have made, made life for myself if I'd um, um, enlarged them. Um, but it was always seemed to be axiomatic that you should, uh, you should work with a life-size image of a coin. I stuck them onto file cards, as you can see there, and I stuck, um, and again, this seems very strange looking back on it, I stuck multiple coins onto file cards as well, which... I think made life more complicated because you were looking at multiple um, dies, different dies on, on, on various file cards. And they also made heavy use of plaster casts, which are very seldom used these days. Um, very few, um, in those days, there were still um, major museums that had people who were able to make these things. Um, and I'm very grateful that I have them actually, because, um, a lot of the, the best images that I um, have are images of plaster casts. And they do, um, uh, pro they, they do make extremely good images. But obviously, um, and um, it's, uh, I, I don't need to labor the point that nobody would work in this way, um, sticking multiple images of coins at life size onto, onto file cards today. It's a very different world that we're in the world of digital photography. So um, this is what, how things have changed since 1991. Um, that time there were 1,450 coins um, that I, I knew of from Antioch and Caesarea. Um, uh, in the book that's about to be published, 
there are de there are details of 5,400. So it's a more than threefold increase um, in coins that have become available for study. And the blue bars there, I'm looking at the different series, the from Antioch and from Caesarea, the blue bars are um, the share the number of coins available in 91 and the orange bars, the number today. And you can see the numbers have grown the, the, the growth, the increase in growth varies a bit and it's at its greatest for the tetradrams of Antioch, where there's been, I think, more or less a six-fold increase. So where have all these new coins come from? Well, <clears throat> in 1991, um, that's on the left-hand side of this, this chart, um, uh, the, the, the column in blue, which is much the largest one, over 80%, were coins in museums. And the column in red, less than 20%, came from the trade and from private collections. And that proportion has been pretty much reversed today. In 2021, um, uh, it's the figures 30% of all the coins of Caesarea come from museums and 70% 70, 70 that come from um, the trade and private collections. So the increase in growth has been very much in coins appearing in trade. Um, and two websites have been particularly helpful, which I'm sure will be familiar with, with most of you, um, Coin Archives. Um, screenshot at the top left and AC search. Um, and that's greatly facilitated um, uh, the, the, the uh, gathering of material. Um, you know, the, I've also been able to add more material from, from museums and from private collections, but most of the new material has come um, from the trade and these two um, websites have been particularly helpful. Of course, that brings its own hazards. And again, this will be very familiar, I'm sure, with most of you. Uh, when you're working on coins that have appeared in, uh, in the trade, you do have to take great care to ensure that uh, you um, uh, uh, connect um, the same coin that is, can appear in multiple um, different auctions. There's an example of a uh, coin of Tranquilina that's appeared is now in <clears throat> a private collection, the Henseler collection, but before that it appeared in three different sales. So that is um, something that you need to spend time on, or you need to spend time doing. I find I found that the number of coins in my corpus as I worked through these duplicate coins in, in sales did get um, significantly smaller as I, as I, I put them um, made the links between them. Okay, so um, uh, yeah, and one one last uh, point about um, the, the the new material. Here I'm looking at the date at which um, the new coin the coins first came to light. These are coins that have appeared in trade, so you can assign a date to when they first appear in a catalog um, or for sale online. Um, and I've separated out um, the bronze and the silver coins of Caesarea. The silver coins is the blue line and the bronze coins are the orange line. Um, and you can see that it's not an even increase. There are certain peaks and I so strongly suspect that if we look at the uh, silver coins, um, there's this very strong peak in 2014, a large number of um, silver coins of Caesarea appeared. And I think that, that we are looking at um, a hoard of coins being dispersed on the market then, and perhaps um, other hoards um, being sold in 2010, the slightly smaller, the smaller peak to the left, and another peak to the right in 2018. If you look at the bronze coins, it's a bit different, isn't it? It's more of a sort of even increase. Um, it, 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 it's not so obvious that there's there's a single hoard um, being dispersed. 
in that, that orange line there. Okay, so let's look in a, a bit more closely at, at um, the, the first issue of um, the Radiates or Antoniani from Antioch. And here are some examples of the most, um, the, the, the mo the, the, the most common type uh, with the legend Iquitas org. And at the top left is a normal coin of that type from Antioch. There's 140 specimens. It is, um, as I said, the most common type. Um, but you also find it with variant obverse busts. So the normal bust is radiate, draped and cuirass seen from behind. But you um, have examples where the bust is seen from in front. That's the third coin along on the top row. And then two examples where the bust is obviously facing to the left. Um, those stand out very clearly indeed. And then you've got very different variety, different variations of the um, design. The normal type shows Aquita standing with a pair of scales and a cornucopiae. We also have Iquitas with a pair of scales and a scepter. Uh, Iquitas standing with a pair of scales over an altar and a cornucopia. That's a strange design. Um, and then um, another variation with a, a different form of the legend, Iquitas Augusti instead of Org. And another feature of this coinage um, from uh, Antioch is significant number of coins that are overstruck on other coins. Um, and um, here is an Iquid coin with Iquitas org. You can probably read the first half of the legend at the left of the coin. This is the bottom left coin I'm looking at. Um, and um, it's on, on a coin with liberalitas. And you can see it reads Iqui on the left and libera on the right. Um, and there's about, I think it's 14 or 15 of these overstrikes that are known, which is really quite a high proportion. You also get um, errors um, quite commonly. Um, on the left, there's a coin uh, with um, where they get the emperor's name slightly wrong, Gorianus for Gordianus. And um, the revert, they also can make mistakes in the reverse legends. Um, this is Concordia Owl instead of Concordia Aug. So, um, but these coins, um, many of them, the coins from the first series um, of radiates, use the same designs as were being made at Rome. And this is where the confusion creeps in because um, they are, if you're describing the coin, um, it is exactly the same description. The difference is um, between the coins from Rome and coins from Antioch is purely one of style. And um, in, in, in this image, I'm showing, I'm pairing coins from Rome on the left and Antioch on the right with um, six different um, reverse legends. <clears throat> Iquitas Org and Fides Militum on the left, on the top row, Pax Augusti and Romae Aeternae, middle row, Victoria Org and Virtus Org, the bottom row and the Rome coins are always the left hand one of the pair, uh, the Antioch coins are the right hand one of the pair. And I think perhaps you can see that the Rome coins are much more neatly engraved, more regularly engraved, um, smaller lettering by and large, um, and um, the, the figures shown in a more even and regular way. Um, the Antioch coins are sort of have rather irregular lettering, they're really rather lumpy by comparison. But this is a difficult thing to explain um, in words. And it, um, it means that um, it's very easy to um, confuse the products of the two mints. And um, another consequence of that is that uh, you have to be very cautious about relying on any catalogs of hordes of these coins um, you can't um, uh, depend on um, there being um, a consistently distinguished, accurately um, distinguishing between the products of Roman Antioch in an accurate way. Uh, you really need 
um, to actually see images of the examples to be sure um, whether you've got a cloin of Rome or Antioch in front of you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so now I'm going to move on to um, the subject of dye studies. And um, uh, as we've got on the call, somebody who's um, infinitely more knowledgeable on this topic than me um, in Warren SD. Um, I'm not going to dwell very long on this slide, but um, this is um, this is essentially um, uh, um, I brought together the, the most important formulae that Warren has um, published for estimating the, the likely total number of dyes um, in a sample, given sample of coins. Um, of which you created a dye study. And um, I think Warren's publications in this field have, um, are, are the main starting point for um, research um, on trying to um, estimate the total number of dyes. Um, and here's a worked out example um, for the tridrams of the third year, year three of Gordian at Caesarea. Um, and we're looking at um, N is the total number of coins in the sample, 51 coins. D is the number of dyes observed, 37 dyes altogether. 28 of those dyes were only known from a single specimen. And six dyes were known from two specimens. The C S is the coverage estimate. That probably means we know 45% um, of the total number of dies and then the figure in bold DSE is is the estimated estimated total number of dies 144 but um, Warren's formulae also include ways of, of working out a range which is extremely valuable um, so that he thinks that um, uh, that the, the, they're likely to be anywhere between 80 and 272 dies um, and on the right hand side, die breakdown, it's the number of coins uh, represented, um, number of dies represented by a single coin, represented by two coins, three coins, and five coins. And then the penultimate column from the right, geometric, um, illustrates another um, way uh, Warren has published of estimating total number of dies, the geometric method, which um, I'll show here. And there you plot on a chart um, the number of dies represented by um, five, four, three, two, one coin. And then you extend that line to the left hand axis. axis um, and that uh, will give you um, another way of estimating um, the total number of dies. Um, and you can do that. In this case, I suggests that um, if you extend this line to the left-hand axis, you would get to around 65 um, dyes, which are not yet known, uh, which would give you an estimated total number of dyes of 105. Um, and here's another example. I'm just going to hurry through these because um, uh, time is pressing. Um, this is a larger coinage. These are the trigrams of year four. And here's um, uh, another ap application of the geometric technique to this coinage. Um, and that um, produces a figure as of maybe around 375. Um, interestingly, using the formulae, you get an estimate of 1194 which does seem high actually. So I think in this case, the geometric um, estimate is probably preferable. But it doesn't work all the time. And um, the bronze coins are much more heavily dilinked um, than the silver coins. And um, here's an example of um, applying it to the bronze coinage of year four. Well, you can see you really can't draw a smooth line there at all. So um, I mean, the fact is those coins are very heavily dialing, so it's actually not a very difficult um, uh, it's, uh, calculation to work out what the likely total number of dies is. 
um, but the geometric method is not so useful in that particular case. So um, this is uh, what we get overall um, for um, dividing the coins of Caesarea between the silver and the bronze issues. Um, uh, the blue um, columns are the total number of dyes observed and the orange, the um, estimated total number of dyes. Um, and you can see that um, there are a large number of dyes not yet known to us for the silver coins. Our sample is still quite small. Um, we, we know of some around 275 dyes, but the estimate suggests it the total is probably well over 800. It's a different story for the bronze coins where there are many more dye links and there we there we don't know all the dyes. Um, the orange bar there for the bronze coins is higher than the blue bar but it's not nearly so much higher. We are much near, more nearly there for those ones. And then one other um, point which um, I haven't really got time to dwell on in detail, but I was able to um, repeat um, dye estimates done on a, the much smaller sample available in 1996 with that available today. And that has given significantly different um, results. Basically, um, the additional coins, the many additional coins that we have today um, compared with 1996, is giving us a higher total number of dyes, um, which seems worrying. But the crucial thing there, I think, is to look at, um, so 585 dyes, um, I thought in, um, was the estimate in 96 and 1610 today. So it's nearly three, time, nearly three times larger. But look at the range. It's actually um, the, the 2021 figure um, does fall within the range. It's at the very top of it, um, but it does fall within the range from 1996. Um, and I think that shows that um, if you are going to uh, use these techniques for estimating the number of dyes, it is really important to have as good, uh, as, as full a sample as you possibly can get. And then this was a piece of work I did a few years ago, published in the um, a festschrift for Bill Metcalf, which the Society published in 2018, where I looked at um, one of the um, uh, 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 the coinage from the second series of radiates from Gordian, where we have a lot of finds data, data from hordes, um, and I compared the frequency of the different types from hordes um, with um, the, the figures from the dye estimates. Dye estimates are um, the uh, green bars there and the blue uh, figures, uh, the blue columns are the fines. Um, there are two issues of coins. The first issue um, is much um, smaller than the, the second issue. Um, and um, But if you look at those two bars, I mean, they're really, it, it, they're, there are differences, but by and large, they do follow the same trends, which I think is quite um, important. And it shows that um, that uh, you uh, can use dye estimates um, for uh, giving an idea of the uh, relative frequency of different issues um, within a coinage. Right. So. Um, Got a few minutes left, I think. Um, I'm just going to look at a few, um, a couple of issues within um, the coins um, that I've been studying. Uh, one of the um, interesting features of the first series of radiates of Gordian, um, there are a hundred different um, entries in the catalog. Um, uh, hundred different types altogether. Significant number of them show the emperor in various guises. Um, and here, here they are. Um, we've got the emperor standing, sacrificing, um, 
he's on horseback in the famous Inventus pose, and he's in a quadriga. This is the second row of coins. Um, and then we have him seated, being crowned by victory, second row, the coin on the right. And then a very unusual design showing him um, between victory, seated between victory and Pax. And then another series of coins with the legend Victoria all, um, the uh, which also show um, victory um, in a quadri in a biga, a two horse chariot. And they also show the emperor on the bottom left coin um, in the Adventist pose as well. That's a very um, high concentration of coins um, showing the emperor in different guises. And I've used those coins to argue that um, it's quite probable that Gordian did actually visit Antioch um, uh, at this time in 239 AD, um, although that is quite um, a controversial topic. And I'm going to close um, with another interesting conundrum, which is whether there are any gold coins known uh, from Antioch at this time. And um, there are four examples of a type um, of a, a, what's believed to be a double aureus. Uh, it's the size of um, an, a radiate, um, and uh, and it has one of the designs on, on one of the radiate designs from the second series, Marty Pacifero. Here are four four examples are known. Um, one of which is in the ANSC's collection, one at the top left, um, and these have normally been um, believed to be modern forgeries. They do look rather different from um, unimpeachable. Um, Auri of um, Gordian there in rather flat and in low relief. Um, and that was how I was treating them until discovery I made um, as part of this project, which is that um, the, the die, the reverse die, um, is also found on a radiate coin. Um, uh, this is, uh, so here's the American Numismatic Society's gold example at the top um, of this slide. And this is a radiate at the bottom of the slide in the British Museum's collection. It's actually found in a coin hoard found in Britain in 1995. And the, uh, the reverse di die is, I believe, the same, um, which makes it hard, I think, um, to condemn the gold coins as forgeries. If they are forgeries, they are made from false dyes, um, which have been um, presumably obtained, made by casting from uh, a, um, a, a genuine um, radiate coin, um, which is a technique that I think is known, but it will be um, quite unusual. Um, the obverse die, by the way, is clearly different. But um, let's just have a look at radiate gold coins of Gordian are very scarce indeed. There are only three examples that are, are known. Two of them are in the Paris collection, shown at the top of the slide. A third example came to light relatively recently in the museum um, from Aquileia in northern Italy. That's the one at the bottom left. Um, and uh, yeah, this coin at the bottom right, the, the color image, is an Adventus Augarius of Gordian from his first series. Um, that um, has at various times been attributed to Antioch, but I don't believe it is from Antioch, um, actually. But um, these um, double Auri in gold, which share dyes with radiates do see are known. And there's an example from um, Philip II from the following reign. There's a gold coin at the top left of that slide, which was sold in Numismatic Fine Arts in 1985. And um, there are radiates known from um, the, the, the same dyes. Um, there's an example at the bottom right of that slide. And those are generally, um, that, that gold coin is generally 
um, accepted as being a, a regular coin. Okay, so um, time to close, I think, and I'll just close with um, this chart, which sort of shows the overall pattern of coin production at Antioch and Caesarea in Gordian's reign. And the blue columns here are the coins from Antioch, the radiates from Antioch, the orange bars are the tetradrams from Antioch, the grey bars are the coins from Caesarea. And what it seems to have happened, happened is that um, Antioch started off with, uh, a, a, well, a reasonably large site, uh, issue of um, radiates. Um, I'm giving estimates of around 14 million coins, um, perhaps for that first issue made in 238-239. It then seems to have switched to producing tetradrams relatively small numbers really by comparison with the radiates and then I believe that the many of the the staff from Antioch were transferred to Caesarea um, uh, which is 280 miles north of Antioch further from the frontier and I think they were transferred there because it was thought to be a safer place they stayed at uh, um, Caesarea throughout 241 AD and for the Big, very beginning of 242, but then they moved back um, to um, Antioch. They produced another quite small issue of tetradrams, the, the orange um, slice in the 242, and then settled down to producing a really major issue um, of uh, um, radiates connected with Gordian's um, expedition to um, against the Sasanians. Um, in 242, which came to an end with his death in 244. So that's um, a, a very quick whistle-stop tour of, um, of um, the, the, the study. Here's um, the, the title page of this of the book, which will be out, as I said, in a couple of months' time. So um, thank you very much for um, listening. And if anyone's got any questions, I'm uh, very happy to do my best to try and answer them. <clears throat> Warren, I see you have a question. Uh, yes. I would like to remark on the so-called geometric method. Uh, thank you for right. citing me so much. But um, yeah, if we went back to that, slide where we got 375 and the formula gave a much higher number. I think I yes. can explain that. Yes. So I'm hoping you can share your screen. Yes, hello. I'll go back. I'll, I'll go back to that. Yes, just give me one minute. I'd be uh, very interested to hear Warren. So um <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I remark that in mathematics, the term geometric refers to multiplication. So if we talk about a geometric series, you could have 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. Uh -huh. right. And that's the slide I want to look at. Yes. And if you uh, draw a curve from 2 to 1, there's a tendency to sort of think additively as if we've gone up by a certain amount. But what we need to do is think multiplicatively. Uh -huh. And if you look at the one there, yeah. it's a little bit less than 100. Right. And if you look at the two there, yeah. it looks like it's about 10. So the difference between two and one, I don't want to think of as 10 yeah. to 100 is 90. Yeah. I want to think of 10 to 100 as a factor of 10. I see. So I've drawn that line completely wrong, incorrectly. Yeah, so that line yeah. is swooping up high enough. You would to... say that should go a lot higher. That should hit the left-hand axis much at a much higher left point. Right. So yeah. I suppose we Thank could you. put the vertical on a logarithmic scale, which makes this work out. Logarithmic yep. scales churn multiplication into addition. But if right. you looked at that 100 yep. mm -hmm. and did the same multiple that you did from two to one, 
Mm -hmm. You'd be up around a thousand. Okay, so actually, and that's the, that the formula gives a figure of 1,194. So you're saying this technique probably should be around there too, much closer to that. Yeah. And yeah, thank you very much for that. I, I yeah. I'd nice. also like to comment that the mm -hmm. number for two, of course, isn't very precise. I mean, reading this, I think maybe you said it was eight. I don't remember exactly what the number was, but there it uh, is. Yes, yeah, it was eight. Mm. It, if yeah, you really toss a coin and get eight heads, next time mm. you might do it. You might get five, or you might mm. get twelve. Mm. And so there's not a lot of precision, which you can see in the. You can uh, see that from the upper there. and lower limits, can't you? Yeah. Interrupt. Yes. I mean, I okay. think what that demonstrates is that we really have um, a very small sample of um, the total number of dice for that coinage, which is um, which is interesting because it's completely the opposite for, for example, the tetradrams of uh, of Antioch, which are very, really very heavily dialed. Yeah. Which means that those coins were um, ha have disappeared from circulation, you know, in a much more a, to much much more considerably than say the coins the coins of Antioch, um, and one wonders whether they were being um, they it was they been systematically removed from circulation and melted down. Um, that's the sort of um, area where you have to look, I think, to try and explain why you know we know so few there are so few dialects for that coinage yeah well thank you very and much for that warren yeah, I, I have one other comment and that mm. is when you were explaining the dates of the new finds of coins and the silver seemed to go up with a hoard and then it flattened out a little bit whereas the yeah. copper kept going up and yeah. I suggest that has mm -hmm. to do with the fact that the internet has made it much easier to sell low value coins. Yes, I'm sure you're correct there. Yes, that's a, definitely a factor. Yeah, yeah. There, there are more Im images appearing online. Right. Yeah. All right, right. Whereas those peaks, I think for the silver coins, you know, they are, Yes, I mean, I don't think there's a great deal you can say about the, the 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 orange line for the bronze coins, but I think the peaks for the silver coins are quite interesting. Yeah, that that does look as though there's a sudden surge of coins coming on the market in the, you know 2010, 2014, 2018. Okay, thank you. Yeah. How do you feel about the fact you had to use so many images from the trade? when some archaeologists feel you should only use yes museum stuff if i relied completely on museum stuff it would be it would have been a very small study <laughs> uh yes i mean that's another argument <laughs> um it's it, it's a real problem isn't it and i think you know it's a great shame that there aren't more um um that 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 uh, so such a small proportion of the coins being found in this area, um, which is largely Turkey, Syria, um, Lebanon, actually are uh, recorded and make their way into museums. I mean, that, that's, that's sad. I mean, Turkish museums um, are, are taking a much greater interest in their coin collections, and there's quite a number that are, that are published, but it's still a drop in the ocean, I think compared with the numbers of coins that are appearing in the trade. Um, I've decided that that's not something I can solve myself, and it's more important to use the information, you know, that, that, is, that has become freely available to everyone. But, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm very aware of the range of views on that topic. Yeah. And we have a question in the chat. Can you comment on the continuation of minting at Antioch and Caesarea and the introduction of mint marks under Philip? Okay, so um, yeah, um, it's very contrasting pictures. 
See, at Caesarea, um, these are the last coins um, that, that were produced from the mint. Um, uh, uh, no coins are known later than Gordian III from Caesarea. Um, in the case of Antioch, um, it's really, um, I suppose, it, it, it's just sort of the beginning to find its feet, if you like, as a mint in, in the reign of Gordian. Um, it carries on making tetradrams in large numbers. Um, uh, I think I saw Jane Sanchinito's on the call. She'll know this very well because she's done a dice study of the tetradrams of um, Trajan Decius. They are very numerous, right down to, uh, right to 253 AD, um, and they um, stop quite suddenly then. Um, Antioch is also making um, the Antoniniani radiates, um, uh, in the under Philip and successive reigns, and from um, the reign of Valerian onwards, it's only making those coins, but it's a major mint, um, all the way through down to um, actually the time of the Arab conquest, um, in, in, in the seventh century AD. Um, and it's really just becoming. Under Gordian, I would argue it's just becoming established as 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 a really important mint, and it was in pretty much continuous production from Gordian's reign onwards. Um, mint marks, sorry, officina letters, yeah, they appear at the end of Philip's reign at Rome. Um, we also have officina marks on the um, tetradrams of um, uh, well. There's a small issue at the very end of Philip's reign. Um, uh, and then they're normal under Trajan Decius and Trebonia on the scalas. Um, I didn't talk about Officina in this talk. I thought that life's a little bit too short, but <laughs> that's another topic, I think. Okay. Thank you. And we have another question in the chat. How did you compare dyes by eye or with mechanical means or by software? I would love to have been able to do it by mechanical means or software. No, it was all by eye. Um, and in 1991, I remember driving myself almost mad, uh, crazy by relying on life-size images. But um, uh, I mean, we're not we're, we're not quite there, to my knowledge, with using um, uh, software for dye comparisons. I think we're getting close. Um, but there are still quite a few practical um, issues to be overcome. Um, I mean, I've seen a very interesting demonstration um, of, a, of, of a program that the ANS has been involved with. It, use, it does need very substantial computing power, I understand, though. And um, one of the issues when you're um, working on coins, putting together coins in, in a corpus in the way that I've been doing, I'm having to um, take in images from a huge range of different sources where the coins are being lit in a different way. I'm using um, ones that have, um, have been photographed from plaster casts as well. So you have to overcome all those other differences um, if you're going to use some you know, automated method for, for dye study. I'm afraid I'm still using old-fashioned eye, the old-fashioned eye technique, um, but the, the huge difference from between now and 30 years ago is that you can um, enlarge these images on screen, um, and, and that is what I think makes it feasible um, in a way that I don't think it would have been 30 years ago. You can work from enlarged images, and that makes it doable on, on screen, and that does make it doable. It's um, it's a large, it's quite a long slog, um, and I'm not proposing to enter any other very large dye studies in the near future. But um, it, it it can be done with patience. Thank. You. So we are almost at the hour. Do we have any mm. last questions? Maybe yeah, one question. Um, mm. Would you comment on the relationship between the <clears throat> the dragma type coinage and the imperial types Antonini. Uh, are we talking about 
coins used together or are they more like complementary? Are they used for the same purpose? It's interesting. I mean, there's a, I mean, I've written a chapter on that on that topic, which I didn't go into here. Um, uh, it look, I mean, uh, we, I mean, one of the, um, one of the things I was able to do for this book was to obtain um, analyses, a uh, good um, body of analyses um, of a hundred coins um, for, for this work. So you can make some um, uh, uh, accurate, um, you have some accurate data on, on the uh, silver content. And it's interesting. It looks as though the tetradram coinage is quite significantly overvalued um, compared with the um, the, the Antoninianus radiate coinage. Um, circulation area um, is very is it was also very interesting um, that the the Antoniniani do actually circulate more or less everywhere. The tetradrams do not travel outside. They travel very little outside of Syria, Greater Syria, that is from um, the borders of um, uh, um, uh, Turkey as far south as Egypt. Um, uh, they're, they're found all over that area, but they do not travel into um, into present-day Turkey in in any significant numbers. Um, so, uh, you know, it's it's a it, it's a differential circulation. Um, the um, Caesarean coinage is different yet again. <laughs> um, they, those seem to travel in the silver coins, and, and our evidence is pretty limited for Caesarean silver. But the ones that we know about um, are mainly found in Georgia, which is um, the northern frontier, um, the northern part of the Rome, Rome's eastern frontier. Uh, so that, that's also quite an interesting observation, I think. Right, um, and a very interesting comment from Brias Michaud on the hoard of silver coins. Um, yeah, he, he knows something about that. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. Um, and as, you, as Brias points out, that hoard was, was very heavily um, consisted of the small drachma coins. Um, doesn't seem to have had the, the, the larger tridrams in it. Well, we are right at the hour, so I, I guess that's it. Thank you so much, Dr. Bland. Get a little round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure and uh, very nice to see you all. Um,